Let's go now to our friend Bimnet of BB uh, from Galaxy Trading. As always, welcome, my friend. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. Fun day this week, fun week this week, I should say. Jay Powell himself, the um, you know fiduciary of the Fed, the the most the, important man in markets, the leader of the Federal Reserve, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. He is testifying in his semi-annual updates to Congress. He did yep. the Senate today's Wednesday. Um, he did the uh, the Senate Banking Committee on Tuesday yesterday. I think he may still be, as we record this, speaking now before the House Financial Services Committee. What are we hearing from Mr. Powell? Um, well, it was a pretty big sort of hawkish tilt um, that we had yesterday from his prepared remarks. Um, basically, he's putting 50 basis point increase for the March FOMC on the table. Um, he's also reiterating higher for, for longer. Um, and essentially, he gave a huge policy update speech um, when, you know, the market wasn't really expecting that much. Um, so it was a pretty big deal. Um, we've had a dramatic repricing of, of, of front-end interest rates, the dollar, and, and risk markets uh, more broadly after um, his comments yesterday. Um, I think they were about as meaningful as an FOMC meeting, a Jackson Hole meeting. Um, it was it really, you know, kind of took me a little bit but by surprise. Um, but I think... The, the, the overall message is entirely consistent with what they've been saying, which is they're going to be data dependent. And what did we have? We just had a string of hot employment price, um, you name it, all the data has been, been really strong. And so what's the Fed's response function? What's the only thing they can do is jack up front end interest rates. And now as we sit here, um, terminal rates are pricing at around 565 basis points wow. um, and 75 basis points for the next two meetings. So uh, some combination of 25 and 50 uh, between uh, wow. the, the, the next two meetings. So it's been pretty dramatic. Um, and you've had you know, S&P break 4K, you know, Bitcoin's testing 22K right now, um, you know, the dollar is broken out. Euro broke 106. Dollar yen through 136. Um, and so it's been it's been a very dramatic um, move. Yeah, dollar is highest that it's DXY highest that it's been since November. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's one of those pain trades where uh, a lot of folks were positioned this year um, to take advantage of dollar weakening, right? As kind of we've you know might have had hit peak terminal rates, right? And you know the the forces abroad. Um, we're going to lead to more inflation and ECB might have to hike more, et cetera. So, so the big theme was short dollars going in and now it's the complete opposite. Right. So folks are off sides, don't really have it. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is, as the dollar is insanely powerful right now, you get paid carry because, you know, rates, rates are, so rates are at 565. Yeah. It's a risk off hedge in case the world is like, we got to sell all risk assets. It's going to do well in, in that environment. Right. And so it's, a currency that's just got this unique combination of, of being a hedge, but also being a hedge that pays. Yeah. And so it's it's really, um, you know, starting to get very compelling just to sit in dollars and just yeah. sit in overnight rates or short, right. short dated duration. Goodness gracious. We talked you talked about this mm -hmm. interesting character, uh, um, these properties and characteristics of the dollar how it's trading um, the uh, but so if they raise 50 yep. at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. They already raised 25, right? Yeah. The last meeting. It's a big so shift like, in policy. That, that would be very dramatic, right? Yes, I mean, the, and, and that's what the market in, is pricing right in now. In theory, like you, you, the way to describe it is the bar is really high for the Fed to go from, like, communicating that they need to go from 50 to 25, doing that, and then going back to 50. Right. Uh, like that might throw their credibility into yeah. into question a little yeah. bit. However, at the same time, like. If they don't react to much hotter than expected data, and they're telling you that they're data dependent, right, right, like, and they also there are tons of Fed members that believe in the um, sort of impact of, of front loading, which is just doing more of, of what you're going to do sooner rather than, than later. Yeah, uh, like then they would also go against their their credibility if they don't go go fifty. So it's crazy. They're they're stuck. Uh, but Powell, you know, yesterday was like. Hey, like we'll uh, go fifty if we well, have to. Well, well, basically, well, it's 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 to the point where the data has to miss really badly between now and and March twenty second or the next FOMC for us not to go fifty. Interesting. That's how he set it up. Uh, that's how he basically set it up, set it up like fifties the likely outcome absent very different yeah. data. Yeah, and then the way to think about it is if he chooses to go twenty five and the market's giving him forty, right. and he leaves fifteen bips on the table, 
that's almost an easing of monetary policy in a way. Right. So, uh, which he doesn't want to be doing. He doesn't want to be doing. Yeah. The other thing I'd be remiss not to mention is the historic levels of curve inversion that we have now just seen. We are talking about a two tens curve that has now broken a hundred basis points. So I think as we sit now, we're at a hundred and seven basis points of inversion. Explain what this is real quick for our listeners if they don't know the inversion here. Um, so essentially, what these curves measure is the difference uh, between interest rates among, at different durations. At different durations. So the popular ones to look at are like two year versus ten year, or two year versus five year. Yeah. Um, or two year versus. 30. So when it inverts, now typically you're supposed to get paid more. To hold debt for longer, right? That's the Correct. idea. Correct. And and There's, the opposite is true now. You're getting paid. Why is that? Uh, it, one, it, it's a belief in in the future path of Fed policy. So, the the market thinks that if you jack up rates to you know five six percent, etc., what is that going to do? That's going to slow the economy down. That's going to slow growth down. That's going to slow investment down, right? And eventually, the Fed will have to cut rates as a as a response to that. And so. What the ten-year point is is kind of telling you is that you know the front-end interest rate policy is not going to last forever. The Fed's going to have to cut things down, and that growth um, is going to be slower as a function of of where the damage that front-end interest rate policy is going to do now. Mm -hmm. And it also has to do with you know expectations of where long-run inflation are going to be. Right. So right now, one-year inflation break-evens are around three and a half percent, and two years are around three and a half percent. So the market's telling you, even though the Fed wants to get to two percent inflation, that it's only going to get to three and a half in with the, monetary policy in the next two years. In the next pricing two years, pricing in what they expect from monetary policy. Correct. Yeah. Which is like, I mean, if I was the Fed, I, I it would, I mean. It, Freaks me out a little bit because it, the I'm markets, jacking. The, the market's telling me you got to jack rates to 560, and you still won't be at yeah, your Yeah, you won't hit goal. your target. Is what the market is saying. Yeah, and now yeah. the market can be wrong for all sure. the time. For right? sure, but but right now, looking at that, I mean, that, it's the best prediction market we've got, right? I mean, correct. there's no other real correct. way to guess here. I mean, and then on the on the inversion, the level yes. of this two tens inversion, because yeah. I saw some stuff about this. Some some researchers were saying that like. The other times that it invert that this level of inversion happened was like 1929 and like. And like the 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 crisis in the seventies, and then also in the eighties, right before Volcker like did his thing. So like very demonstratively, uh, historically speaking, yeah, always I mean, precedes like a major economic problem. Yeah, correct. Uh, so it, it's tricky. At the same time, like we have this issue right now because the economy is so hot. Right. Right. We're talking about historic levels of unemployment two job openings per unemployed person. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, prices that are still going up in, in, right. in the, so the non-shelter services which isn't in particular. the same as the other times. And, and frankly, Correct. every time and is different, right? You could have an exception time, to the Every rule. time is different. And to be honest with you, like, there, there's a reasonable case to be made that, you know, the growth trajectory of the U.S. is, is totally fine, right? Just think about the, the kind of things that, that are happening, the structural things that have happened post-COVID, onshoring being a huge one of those things, right? You're bringing back domestic production into a really tight labor force. <laughs> right. Uh, and you've also just had, like, like generally a lot of underinvestment over, over the past couple of years. I mean, energy companies are being, like, a big part of it. Like, what was the thing to do over the past couple of years? It was to take advantage of low interest rates. How did you take advantage of low interest rates? You issue a lot of debt, and you buy back your stock. Or you issue a lot of debt, and you, uh, you know, issue a dividend right right not necessarily reinvestment reinvestment yeah right and so the u.s i think you know structurally is headed towards a, a period of onshoring reinvestment etc and now you know will the interest rate sensitive parts of the economy slow down yes absolutely they have to and just mathematically like homes will get cheaper if mortgage rates rise right fewer just, people will buy them they'll be yeah they have to uh but that's not the the whole economy. Other stuff looks good, though. Other stuff looks just fine. Yeah, and that's why, like, like right now, um, you know, I, I I keep struggling with this idea. Like, are you supposed to be long interest rate or, or short interest rates? It's it's really tough. Uh, part of me is like, can the world, like, can the U.S. economy really handle like six percent inflation, etc.? And I really, I really do think that a lot of the perception that the market has, and, and this is just kind of me self-reflecting, is just a function of just the environment we've been in for the past couple of years. 
Right. I, I've never seen low, int- like high interest rates in my entire career. Right. For the most many part. people have M- many people haven't. Yeah. I've also been you know very U.S. focused. When you talk to anybody that is based abroad, especially in EM, they know inflation is a tricky issue. Like they j- I've seen it their whole lives. It's right. not something that just goes away. Right. And so I think there's a lot of. Like just bias in the U.S. that that's just used to like low inflation, right? Low and if it gets rates. high, then of course it will have the, to come down. Yeah, of course, because the economy will correct and like, blah that's blah blah. That's how we do it here. That's how we do it. But but I think more and more as time progresses, we're like, holy shit, the U.S. economy is just fine with interest rates at five percent plus. <laughs> uh, however, you know, I, I do think you know you are supposed to to kind of realize that there are unintended consequences to, to monetary policy and we are at uncharted in uncharted territory with respect to certain things and that you know anytime you raise the cost of capital from zero to six percent there are gonna something's be gonna outs, happen yeah right if you're in the in the venture world for example or in the in the private world I mean you really like like it's hard. why are you going why are you taking the illiquid risk? Uh, at high valuations. For like 10 years in 10 some years, cases. When you yeah. can get 6% on <laughs> yeah. low duration stuff. Yeah. Those business models are going to be fundamentally challenged. And also, you know, basically business models that have lots of liabilities in the front end or floating liabilities, right? And like, you know, one of the better examples is that you know, I used to deal with a publicly listed company. Their whole business model was finance in the front end and buy assets in the back end. And all of a sudden... They're totally underwater. It's like They're, reversed. It's reversed. Yeah. And and this and if you think about it, like the Fed's balance sheet right now, that's exactly what it is. It's they have this oh, these liabilities, which is they got to pay these banks, you know, interest on excess reserves. What are interest on excess reserves? That's going to be you know top of the band. It's really high, right? And and what do they have on their balance sheet? A ton of assets, like long duration, like long duration assets, paying yeah. less. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think the average duration of the Fed bond portfolio is probably like six years, seven years, yeah. something like that. Um, but they've got overnight rates to pay. They've got to pay the banks. Yeah, they got to pay the banks on all their wow. excess interest, and so you're, that's that's how you become insolvent. Yeah, something's got to give ultimately. You know, yeah. uh, but luckily it's paper losses. And currently, right now, you're saying it mostly looks okay in the economy. If if it's not even maybe okay, maybe even great. If everything looks jobs fine. people have jobs. Here's here's the other. I mean, risk. real wages are still like below inflation, right? I mean, they're like they're yes, re- we, real wages, wages have have but not wages been keeping have grown. Up. Yes, they been, have. But here's the yeah. thing. So it's it's different. Like you have to think about it. Like from what time period? Because I think the the wage growth is, has been a recent phenomenon. Right. Uh, versus like there were periods where folks were just not getting raises to keep up with it. Well, there was no inflation, so there weren't no no raises. Um, so you really have to focus on on right. the, the the time period. Uh, but yeah, I mean, 100 million Americans because of the Social Security cost of living adjustments, they just got a, a raise, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily wages, but that's it's money in your pocket. Money in your pocket, right? Um, oh, it's, a lot I mean, of the, I saw a lot of the unions have negotiated significant raises. Absolutely, like, I saw the airlines are, are uh, yeah. So there are a lot of people who are making more money too. So, but I just mean to bottle that all up, like like you said, like there is there is structurally a lot of structural positivity in the economy. Yes, and it can clearly it appears at the moment to be bearing these rates. Um, and, and, and the yeah. other risk I think is really important to highlight is you have a nation of 1.3 billion people that is just reopening. I know China. Uh, yeah. Powell is being asked about it, but there are huge risks to the commodity complex. Right. Like God forbid oil starts spiking again and all of a sudden people are like, wait, gas prices are up and there's a pass through uh, feedback loop of energy prices into the prices of everything. Yep. And then Not to like, mention oil is a component in many other materials right like an absolutely absolute, plastic yeah. like all, yeah. all of the above and so there's still upside risks this is such a tricky man oh it's a my tricky, god it is it is what's it feel yeah. like i mean i mean you're you know you're not like you you're you've been in markets a long time but you know not for decades yes so um and like you said your whole career has been in a low interest rate environment along with basically absolutely. anyone who's yeah worked in low the last interest 15 rates years are low vol uh, this is, very this, is different. this is yeah. a very different tricky uh, yeah, environment absolutely um you know i think is it more fun it is really fun. like just as a trader. It, I mean, as like, a trader, it is so more much fun, interesting stuff. But you happening. just have to like the. It's just so dynamic that you just have to adjust your risk, right? Like trading 10k of DVO one, like you know, three years ago, is very different than trading 10k of DVO one now. Like when the stuff moves three times more, yeah, you got to be taking a third the risk. 
right? And so it's it's very dynamic, um, and it, it really keeps you on your toes. Yeah, love it. Bimnet, BB, Galaxy Trading, as always, my friend, thank you so much. Pleasure. <laughs>